Hey guys, I hope you're doing great. Um, I want to dive into a subject tonight that I have been getting a lot of questions about over the last, mm, let's just say a year of my life, but specifically in the last three, four, five, six months. And, and that subject is, what is a culture of honor? And this is such a beautiful subject, but it's, uh, it's probably my favorite thing to talk about. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna thread a few lines here because I think that um, I could definitely go down the road of my faith because that's where my honor comes from. I could certainly go down my biblical studies and give you plenty, of, and I could go down a study of what honor really is from the standpoint of, let's say, a yogi. Right? I think the most common thing you hear in a yoga study is namaste. What does that mean? What does it mean? Uh, the most common quote I know of is, from that what is divine and good in me, I salute and bow to that which is good and divine in you. Honor is doing to one to others. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, my pastor says it's, it's treating people as if unto the Lord. So it's a very interesting thing. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to walk down this road. So I want you to just bear with me. I'm not going to give you a sermon here, even though I'd love to. It's my favorite thing to do. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just talk to you about this new economy, right? Um, we've heard the term the information economy. It's a very common term today. And so the currency of our modern economy would be information. But I would call the currency of our up and coming economy is purpose. We're a purpose driven economy. We're a purpose driven world. And purpose is separating businesses. You have those that make the bottom line a higher priority of profit over people. You have people that place a, a, a mandate of performance and numbers over connection and authenticity. And I'm not going to argue which ones are better or worse from a moral standpoint. I'm not going to judge anybody. That's not my job. That's not what I do. That's not how I roll. I just want to talk to you about what I think is happening in our world, this whole new world. We are building an organization of the people, by the people, for the people, if you don't mind me quoting a little American history. What does that mean? We're building an organization that is, that is grassroots. It's coming up out of the people, for the people, designed to help them become their best. There's a saying, he who holds the light for his friends sees his own path more clearly. So we build an organization where we're designed and dedicated to help people achieve their dreams. And in doing so, it's of the people, for the people, by the people. So it's connected, it's, it's organic, it's, it's grassroots, it, it's not ivory tower, it's not 30,000 foot level, it's, it's in the trenches of connecting with the true needs of people. There are really three components, serving the needs, enabling personal growth, and building a sense of community. These things have to be the staples, right? We have to be really digging in. What do we teach? You need to diagnose before you prescribe. In the medical world, if you don't do that, you, you get sued with malpractice probably. If you're a, a lawyer and you don't do discovery, you, you might be disbarred. It, it's part of your job as a professional. And oftentimes in the in the coaching world or the consulting world or, or what we do is, is we think that it's all about presentation. we got to get out of the presentation and get into the conversation. A culture of honor is dedicated to identifying where people are hurting, where their needs are, what's going on in their world, and slowing down for enough time to really connect, to dig into these key things. It's, it's empowering coaching versus controlling, right? It, it, a culture of honor is based on trust versus based on fear. And maybe they'll seem extreme, but what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of organizations that teach if you don't do this, this is going to be your punishment. Or if you do this, you're going to have this failure versus saying, if you do this, this is what you'll gain. When I coach baseball, we had two ways to teach kids, how not to do it and how to do it. And most people seem to teach how not to do it. They're in there and they're in the batter's box. They're 12 years old. And they're scared. And what they say, don't step out. It's the same thing as saying, keep your front shoulder in, right? Right? If you say, don't move your feet, and you just say, hey, dig that back foot in. Right? You're saying what you want as compared to saying don't. And these are big things in our new world that we've got to learn to identify. We need to find how to harness. If we want to build a true culture, we've got to become 
transparent. People need to see our hearts. They need to see what's right and what's not right, what's good and what's not bad, right? It needs to be a, a, a place where the financial gain is not a priority over personal development. It's got to be an environment where financial advancement is not the primary measurement of success. And this is so hard to do in our performance-based world and this bottom line, this doggy dog, this stockholder, this I got bills to pay, I got things to do. And what you got to come to a peaceful realization is that your success, your dynamic ability to create future prosperity for your family is going to be based upon your ability to truly connect with people, your ability to create a culture, your desire to hold the light for your friends is going to be based upon your willingness to be transparent, to determine what's going on in their life, to get behind helping them develop a plan for personal growth, and then a community, a culture of which wraps their arms around people. The fuel of the purpose-driven economy is honor. Honor. It's like an old school word, right? And I'm excited about the fact we're retrofitting, we're refitting, we're, we're bringing back old school concepts and making them new. You go to Denny's Diners and you look at Chuck Berry tennis shoes and high tops and you're seeing skinny jeans come back, which used to be around in the 50s and 60s and so forth. It's, it's taking old concepts and adding a fresh twist. And a fresh twist to honor is really learning how to take it from macho bravado to caring and serving. That's the twist. Honor used to be a, a knights of honor, right? Or something super bold and super courageous. And really what it is, it's about going deep. If you want to go high, you got to go deep. It's really caring enough to slow down, to listen and diagnose before you prescribe. There's all kinds of surveys. Like I saw a survey the other day that said 92% of those surveyed said, if I knew the culture that I was supporting was adding value to other people. If it was built on honor, if it was built on adding value to other people's lives, I would switch from one provider to another. If the, if the, if the prices were relatively the same, even a little bit higher, 92% said I would switch if I knew that the concept was about adding value to people's lives. This is amazing. In fact, I saw another study by, I think it's an organization called Imperative. Interesting name for a company, but Imperative said that in 2015, that those that come into an organization that are purpose oriented outperform everybody else in every measure, measurable facet production, retention, connectivity, every measurable facet. Those that were purpose oriented outperformed those that were not. Now, how amazing is that? And yet, you know, we think that, oh, we live in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. We live in this thing where it's all about grind, grind, grind. When in reality, it's not. Not anymore. The world's changed. And you know what? Thank God that it's changing. And we get to build an organization around this. We get to build an organization of dynamic people that get it, right? Have you heard the story about the, the group of men that were at a, at, a, at a big concrete slab and they were pouring concrete footings and rebar and it was messy and muddy and this guy walks up and says, well, man, what are you guys doing? The guy says, I'm pouring concrete. What's it look like? Duh. Walks up the next guy. He says, man, what are you doing? He goes, dude, we're building a building here. We're building a new structure, a new building. Okay. Goes the third guy and says, what are you doing? He goes, well, it's really cool. Over here is where we're going to feed them. Over here is where the counseling center is going to be. Over here is where they're going to have their own private rooms so they can actually get some quality sleep. We're building a care facility for homeless, and we're going to educate them. We're going to help them get some dignity. We're going to feed them quality meals. We're going to reinvent how they look at the world by increasing their self-image and their dignity. One person thought he was doing a job. One guy thought he was building a building, and one guy knew he was making a difference. How huge is this? Now, a lot of you guys have heard of that company called Gallup, right? Gallup. The Gallup poll, right? It's real common. There's a company called Gallup Healthway. And Gallup Healthway does this thing called a, um, a health survey. Oh, wait a minute. It's, called, it's a, a well-being well index. That's it. A well-being 
index, and they measure this, and they have been polling a thousand people a day since 2008. Okay, so that's a that's a lot of people. A thousand people. That's 365,000 people a year times 2008. You're know, talking about millions of people here now. And it says that Americans feel worse about their jobs now than they ever have before. They feel worse about their jobs now than they did at any time prior to why. Why is this? And I'm telling you, I, here's what I believe is. I believe it's because corporations are missing it. According to surveys, and again, I've been researching this, so I'm trying to figure out what's going on. How do I get in contact with, with the real world? I want to build an organization that honors people. I want to build an organization that blesses people. I want to build an organization of the people, by the people, for the people. I, I want to be the signature of my life, helping people regain their dignity through the power of a dream. The power of contribution. In the past, the dream was always about money and material and stuff like that. But the dream now is contribution. But corporations miss it. Corporate surveys say that the, the, the three leading motivators, corporate hierarchy, say it's money, security, and promotion. <laughs> okay? However, when employees are surveyed, I think you're going to agree with me. Here's what you're going to hear. The number three answers. One, appreciation. They want to feel appreciated over money. Now, that's hard to believe, but the world's changing. The second thing is they want to feel like they get to have a, a, a voice in how things are being done. It's, it's, they're kind of the ground troops, and they feel like, look, I would like to have a voice. I would like to, to, to feel like I'm in on things. Okay. And the third one is an understanding attitude. <laughs> Versus money, security, and promotion, it's actually appreciation, feeling like they can contribute, and that there's an understanding attitude. What a difference. But the reality of our world today is that we have a chance to build something very dynamic without being wealthy. Now here's what's amazing. Wealth will come as a result of contribution. I believe that the more you serve, the wealthier you are. Now, you may not be get a fat paycheck, but you'll be wealthier. As your soul prospers, so shall you. The more people you impact, there is no medicine in the world for the soul like serving other people. When you take your four T's and you make them go to work for you, your time, your talent, your treasure, your testimony, you take your time and you're generous with it by donating your time and impacting people. That might be just sitting down with someone and listening. I used to get so frustrated. I sit down with one of my counselors and I say, you know, I have a question for you. It's blah, blah, blah. They go, okay, okay. Like, I, 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 what I want to say, I wasn't done yet. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let me just tell you how I ask that question every time I get it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Um, I've only asked this question once. Right, I didn't say this, but I'm thinking, well, what about individuality? What about my unique situation? What about, and I guess I was kind of a, an early feeler of, of look, I, I'm I'm a human being here. I, I'd like to know personally. Not I don't want to know boilerplate answer. I don't want you to know your every answer. I want to know your answer for me. I want to be valued. And maybe I was being a little baby. I don't know, but I wanted to feel like I was mattering. So sometimes it's just stopping and listening, right? It's like the story of the little boy that goes next door to his neighbor's house, and the and the old man was living across and just just lost his wife of fifty years and. He goes over and spends all day with him. Comes back, his parents say, well, what'd you do, Timmy? He goes, nothing. I'm like, nothing? He goes, no. He just wanted to cry. And he just wanted me to be there. So I just hung out. Hmm? It's like the story I tell often about my son and I, knowing when he was a little guy, we were driving my big F-250 pickup truck, and we're cruising around going to Home Depot or something, and I look over to him like, I'm sorry, buddy. You can't even see out the window, can you? You're so small. You can't even see the dash. And he looks up at me. And I said, I got to get you some phone books. Lift you up here. Get you a booster seat. Let me see what's going on. He goes, it's okay, Dad. I can see you. One of those special moments frozen in time. Because that's really what it boils down to. It's your time. It's your talent. Maybe you can teach people to do art. Maybe you can teach them to include poetry. Maybe it's singing. Maybe it's kindness maybe teaching them to read maybe teaching them to write maybe it's just going down and and generate uh donating your time as a physician or a school teacher or uh whatever right maybe so maybe it's your talent right maybe it's your treasure 
right? Maybe it's things you have in your house, like, you know what, this would be better served by somebody else. Like the story of the young boy who got delivered 12 balloons by his dad. And what are most balloons they wrote? Plate the ceiling, free and open the ceiling. Dad's like, well, I didn't really have much impact. So what's he do? Takes that son, goes down to the uh, old folks facility, and goes bed to bed delivering a balloon to every one of those people. Twelve balloons later, his world was changed. It isn't what we get. It's what we give that makes the impact. So our time, our talent, our treasures, or our testimony. Maybe it's just our story. Have you ever had anybody say, hey, I know how you feel, and you're like, no, you don't. And you think they don't? And then you tell you the story, and you're like, whoa. Yeah, you do know. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's okay. I don't walk around the big sign that says, hey, I went through this, but it's part of my story. And I went through my test. Now I have a testimony, so let me share it with you. Maybe that's what it boils down to. So, guys, we're in a world today that it's about connecting. I'm going to give you a couple more stories, a couple more examples, then I'm going to wrap this up, okay? The University of Pennsylvania um, recently did a survey a couple years ago, and I read about this a while back, where they were uh, in the department that was fundraising department. So they make phone calls trying to raise money for the university, okay? And so they did this study where they, were, they took three groups, and they gave them each a different training. One group was trained, if you do this and you go through this, you're going to develop incredible sales skills, which will prepare you for your career, and you're going to be you're going to be much more dynamic at, at be, being a salesperson. Okay. The second group was said, okay, um, we're going to give you testimonies of what all the money did to impact people uh, through their donations, what they would do with the alumni and the medical programs, and where those donations went to work. And the third group was told about how amazing the university is, and what a great place to donate to, and what an unbelievable school it is, and how many years it's been on, and all the kids are graduated, and blah blah blah. You want to know this? I know you know where I'm going with this, but here's the facts. They ran this study five times. Five different desk groups of three types of people. And every single time, group number two, the ones that were told testimonials of the changes that, were made, that, that happened as a result of donations, doubled, doubled, two times, twice as much contribution was made by the group that were told the stories about what the money was used to impact people's lives. You follow me? This is the world we live in today. We've got to learn to connect with the fact that people need help. A lot of you guys know Kurt Goat, one of my good buddies. You know what Kurt Goat's about? Blanketing America. About, about, about putting a blanket on every homeless person or person that needs Because when he was a little boy, well, before he was a little boy, his daddy was a homeless. And a guy gave him a bed, a Bible, and a warm meal. He said, if you just go to church with me. And that daddy got saved and his world changed and raised an unbelievable family that literally has impa impacted hundreds of millions of people out of generosity. It's incredible. I mean, the stories go on and on and on. So really, what we try to want to do is, <laughs> try to want to, is that good? What we want to do is build an environment to where we build people up through identity by, by focusing on what is great about them without tripping over what is not. Right? Because the world wants to knock you down and remind you of all your mistakes and all your failures and will restore you when you've done your 400 repentance and all your Hail Marys and all the little things you think you need to do. Right? That's, that's, that's the culture of dishonor. You're going to go to jail, whatever that version might be. It could be business jail, corporate jail, or real jail. And when you've done your time for your crime, then we're going to begin to restore you, but we're going to keep an eye on you and we'll see how it's... And to me... That might be necessary in the in the penal system. Is that the word for it? Sounds that sounds bad, but you know what I mean. In the in the jail system, if you will. Okay. However, that is not the right concept in a culture of honor. We're going to focus on what's good without skip, tripping over what is not. So what we're going to try to do is raise people up through honor and identity to a point where the light comes back on. And when the light comes back on, then they can start impacting people's lives. Because I want you, I want your story to reach other people's lives. I want you to be the light of the city on the hill. I want you to be the lamp on the desk. I want you to be that point of light in a dark world. And everything you've been through has a royal purpose. And that royal purpose is promotion. To be a higher level of understanding of compassion, of connection, so you can go out and reach other people. Guys, you may be the only person that can reach someone. 
right? What's that old saying? You might only be one person in the world, but the one person you might be the world. And don't let what you can't do prevent you from doing what you can do. We've got to learn to develop the servant's heart. And when you develop the servant's heart, then you're going to get that connection. That's what's going to happen. You're going to be making this radical impact in people's lives because you really care. Last example. You've heard of a company called Mozilla? Am I even pronouncing that right? You know, Mozilla, big company, right? Here's one of the corporate exercises they did. I read about this a little while back. This is really cool. They, they put these people through this big weekend retreat, corporate training on mentorship and serving and honor. And then here's what they did. Unannounced, they took a handful of these leaders that were in the program and went down to a place called Half Moon Bay. Right, So came from Santa Clara, Silicon Valley, down to Half Moon Bay, which is a coastal town out there in, in uh, Central California, if you will. And they said, you need to find somebody that you can serve and help them add value. All right. They didn't drop them off at, a, at a, a center for homeless. They didn't drop them off at a you know Habitat for Humanity and say volunteer time. They said, go find a place to add value. Okay. Now, I'm trying to imagine these um, somewhat uh, stuffy corporate people or maybe some young people that were at the top of their class, super sharp, super bright, and got picked up for this big internet company. And you only do what? Wait, wait. What does that have to do with developing... Uh, a web browser. What does it have to do with technology? They want people that understand the serving heart. They want people that understand courage, empathy, and service. So there they go. So they had to risk looking like a crazy person. They had to find a way to connect. They had to, ris to risk rejection and belittlement. They had to be willing to find a way to help someone. And so as the day went on, they had to learn how to ask questions. They had to learn how to understand honor. They had to come to the realization that to serve is a privilege and an honor that is earned. Not just because you are in this position and they're in this position, so therefore, no, no, no. It was come in as an equal and serve, right? I read a, a, a story about a concept called Genshai. Genshai, and I don't really know where that all comes from, but I you know, say it has something to do with the religion. But Genshai basically says this, that you never, ever treat anybody as they're any better or any worse. Everybody's an equal. If you're going to give something to homeless, you get on your hands and knees, you give it to them. They're on their hands and knees. You meet everybody at the same level, and you show honor to that which is good in them. Because this is how you build a culture. This is how you build a team. you got to be vulnerable, and you got to be resourceful. You gotta let people see what's going on inside of you, and you gotta be resourceful enough to find out what's going on inside of them. And this is how you will learn courage, empathy, and service. This is how you will develop, I believe, the biggest dreams for all of us a legacy, mastery, and complete freedom. I could spend an hour on subject alone. Legacy, what will we say when you're gone? Mastery, 10,000 hours of committing your life to something to where you master it, to where you're making such an impact. You move in unconscious competence. You're, you're, you're automatically connecting at the level of honor. What do we teach? You teach what you know, but you impart what you are. You mean you release something into an atmosphere. You release a grace into people when it's coming from here. And that can't happen until you get that true connection. And that's mastery. That's a lifetime of serving and helping people. And I've met some incredible people in my life. I'm going to use an example, a guy named Bill Britt and Ron Pierre, two gentlemen that for their entire life, and I'm going to add Dexter Yeager, of course, to that, three guys that are pretty amazing individuals that their entire life was committed to helping people try to figure out how to get free of any chains that were kept in to, to, to poverty or to mediocrity. And we could go and we could add Jobs and McCaw and Allen and Gates and you want to go on and on of people that have committed their lives in modern era to making an impact, helping people wake up. And then lastly, freedom. What is freedom? Freedom is when you're no longer bound by other people's opinions. Freedom is when you have transcended the highest level of life, and I'll call it surrender. The five S's, survival, right, starvation time, stability, success, significance, surrender. What does surrender mean? That means you're living exactly why you're born. Mark Twain, best two days of your life. Day you're born, day you figure out why you're born. Folks, this is what a culture of honor is.
This is when you become selfless. It is about how many people can you serve. It's about how many people can you impact. Guys, I wish I could tell this story around the world a million times. Maybe share the video around the world and let it go viral if, if, if that's God's intention. My point is this. I wish the world knew that the breakthrough to the next hundred years in our civilization, I believe, well, let's just say next 20 years, okay? You know what it's going to be? Purpose. Honor. Based on integrity. Courage. Empathy, service, connecting. All these old school words, not something cool, technological. It's learning to connect. It's doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Right? That's the whole concept. And, and, and that's what honor is. It's seeing what's good without tripping what is not. It's building a community where people feel safe, not because it's sterile, not because it's perfect, not because... It's full of fear and rules so no one can make a mistake. It's safe because if you make a mistake, we're not going to beat you down. We're going to put our arms around you and say, we love you. You matter. That action is not you. We're going to find a way to re-anchor your identity so strong and so solid that you never return to that behavior. What do most people do? Beat you down and try to beat it out. Well, I don't think you can beat it out because what happens is you take a beating like... Peace out. I'm going downstream. And you go somewhere else and you just pass this, that problem on the next person. True honor is hanging in there. When the fit hits the sham and you say, I'm going the distance with you, bro. I'm not. You can leave me, but I am not leaving you. I'm going to be here on the porch waiting for you to come home, son. I love you. You're valuable. I see greatness in you. And I am never going to give up on you. You know who we do that with? Our family. Well, I believe we're all family. I believe we're all part of a kingdom. Family, brothers and sisters that need to be there for each other, to love each other, to heal each other, to serve each other. And we have this as an organization, guys. This is why there's such a movement, such a growth about what we're developing is it's all based upon this new economy, the information economy, is shifted to the new economy. The new economy is the purpose-driven economy, and the fuel for the purpose-driven economy is honor. It's been a blessing to share this message with you. I hope it has an impact. I look forward to seeing you guys. Let's rock and roll. Let's make the rest of 2017 and 18 and 19 the most amazing years of our entire lives, guys. I love you. I hope to get a chance to Sit down and have a cup of coffee with you sometime and connect at a real level. You're important. You matter to me. You matter to Shelly. We love you. All right. See you soon.